Hi and welcome to the next episode of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And this is the second part of our chat with uh, sci-fi and fantasy author Richard Morgan. So if you haven't listened to the first part, I'd urge you to go back, listen to that episode first, where Richard gave us lots of interesting tips and we heard about his uh, real struggle, really, to get published yeah. uh, before he became a great success. But in this episode, we continue to speak to Richard and he gives us many more useful writing tips. He talks about how you create work, the sort of worlds that he's creating, you yeah. know, sci-fi and fantasy, you're, you're having to do a lot of world building and he talks about how he does that. Sometimes exposition info dumping is useful if yeah. it's done in the right way. Yeah. Sci-fi worlds are the hardest one to build, oh, and fantasy I suppose, yeah. but that, any world where it's not one we know it's Yeah, there's it's not difficult. as many points of reference. Exactly, yeah. and how yeah. do you build that world without... It, reading like a Wikipedia entry, yeah. which everyone hates. Exactly. So uh, he's got some really good uh, views on that. He made some very strong views on sci-fi movies. He does. He does towards the end of the podcast. And we also talk about the journey of Altered Carbon onto Netflix uh, and the long journey that that yeah. had to Almost get to the Almost as long screen. as it took to get the book out. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it does, I will warn you, Spoiler alert, uh, we do <laughs> we do give away some of the uh, twists in the TV series of Alter Carbon uh, on this episode. So if you haven't seen it yet, pause, go watch all eight episodes, whatever it is, <laughs> and then come back and listen to the rest of it. And at the end of the episode, we also have the prize draw for Claire Askew's signed novel, What You Pay For. Claire was on uh, last or two episodes ago now, and uh, she very kindly signed a copy of her latest book, Hardcover. So we'll give that away as well as a copy of page one, the writer's notebook. Yeah, so uh, lots to get through in this yeah. episode. Hope you enjoy it. And we'll be back at the end of the podcast to talk a bit more about what Richard had to say and also to do that draw. Perfect. See you then. I mean, one thing about about your books I've always liked is that you you tend to drop folk right in them. Uh, you know, you you use terms and technologies, but I mean, you won't explain what. There's no info dump, which a lot of sci-fi authors no. tend to put in, and, and often that's it's quite it kind of drags that, it down. Yeah, I was going to start. ask about that. I mean, that is a difficult. If you're yeah. right, if you're creating a new world or setting it in a new time or whatever, there it is difficult, or it can be difficult to get that information across to. Yeah. Your reader without it just being a big Here's or, or someone walking into an office and someone mm. telling you a big paragraph <laughs> about what, what yeah. we like never would never see in real life. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. It's I mean, info dumping is interesting because, um, like so many of these things, we've we've taken kind of extreme positions on it, and and there's this sort of horror of it. I, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with an info dump, provided it's done stylishly. Yeah, you know. Because there are ways to do that, and and um, I mean, I I don't know if you, I, you either of you guys read much Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the, I mean, if you take Salem's Lot, right? There, there's a brilliant sequence in Salem's Lot where he's talking about the town, and he basically sort of introduces a bunch of small of these small town characters and what they're do- doing. They're going about their lives in various ways, um, and he, it's very. Um, literary in the sense that it's very overt he just sort of says right i'm going to take your hand now and i'm going to lead you through this this small town i'm going to point out these people to you and it's it starts with this thing also about about you know you imagine that you're a farmer and how you came to get stuck in this town because you you know you married young and then you had kids and 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 i don't know if you'll remember this particular section um there's a bit where he's it's talking i say it's talking about how you know you you marry the girl and then the girl turns into the woman and you get a big bed and you make the ch- the children in the big bed and uh, um it's really rather beautiful and i, I think it's some of king's best writing it's mm-hmm. it's got a lovely lyrical feel to it and it is essentially an info dump because he's what he's doing is he's just saying right okay i've given you a couple of chapters of scary shit where are we we're in this town called salem's lot and you want to know about Salem's Lot? Okay, bang. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, and there's absolutely nothing with, wrong with doing that. You know, they're, they're, so if an info dump can be delivered in a in a, a beautifully written, stylish fashion, I have you know, I I have no objection to it, and I think in a way that's actually better 
than than having one of these grating conversations where two characters tell each other, yeah. you know, about you know, as you know, as you know, Jack, we're yeah. able to get there really fast because the internal combustion engine drives these vehicles at a very high speed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a sort of conversation that would never occur yeah. in real life. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't want to be having those conversations. No. So you, I mean, I, I think you can do a lot with implication. You can do a lot of, you know, you just throw the, as you say, you, you throw the reader in, mm-hmm. you give them some terminology that's that's vaguely sort of informative in, you know, the, the way it's, you, you give a, something a name that, that more or less describes it. And, and yeah, you let the characters, I, I find what's really, really good, you know, a tip for anyone listening. Um, what's really good is to get your characters to bitch about things. Right. Because, because when we bitch about things, we do tend to, state the bleeding obvious mm-hmm. you know when it, i noticed this my, oh, quite recently with it like like talking to people about brexit and i find that i'm i can hear my conversation in my head and i'm like you know we the two of us here we're basically stating things that are blatantly obvious yeah. and we've probably already said them many times yeah. before yeah. um but it, because in the nature of a bitching conversation that you do that you know mm-hmm. because you will you'll 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 sort of go on about you know patent patently obvious things yeah. um and complain about them so that's quite a good way of doing it you very often you can if you can get a character to to bitch and moan about some aspect of your world then then you can do a quite a lot of 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 really quite overt info dumping in in, in that mm-hmm. dialogue um but it's you know the whole thing is a movable feast i mean you you, you you've got to see what the, the the fabric of the writing will take how much you can get away with but you know there are times again i think it's you know it's one of these little these snapshot things that that you get a writer's uh workshop things where, like you know show don't tell yeah yeah and it's like well yeah um but actually sometimes there are some quite cool ways of telling you know yeah, and, absolutely yeah. and so so it's it all of all of those anything that is a little epigrammatic comment on how to write i think always treat those with suspicion because because actually the truth of the matter is you probably can do the thing they're telling you not to do but it's a question of if you can bring it off with sufficient elan that Mm -hmm. uh, that no one minds yeah um but yeah science fiction does have this peculiar issue of uh, how do i make an unfamiliar world feel familiar yeah and uh, yeah, and that takes work because you've got to find ways to integrate this stuff into conversation. You've got to, you know, sort of throw out these illusions and things, and also get them all in quite early on. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so that by the time you're, you know, sort of ten or twelve chapters in, we're like, okay, we're all settled in. We know roughly what 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 everything is and how it works, yeah. and then roll with that. Yeah, and also I think certainly in my own experience of trying to write stuff, it, sometimes there can be a, well, speaking personally, as I say. Uh, there can be a temptation to over explain sometimes how a bit of tech works or something like that. And then mm-hmm. when you come back to redraft it or something, you realize none of that is actually, you yeah. know, it might have helped me formulate what the tech is At in my time. head. But now that the, you know, now that I'm rereading it, a reader's not going to need to know any of that information. So I'm going to pull all of that out, but leave the basic thing in yeah. there. So, yeah. and then move on. From that point. I absolutely well. I mean, that's Hemingway, isn't it? Hemingway said uh, something along the lines of, "My writing gets stronger the more I remove from it." Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's that is a good, you know, a good general rule of thumb. Although, again, subject to the same proviso that there are times when you're going to need to break that rule. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think in general with writing, implication is far more powerful than than just you know statement. And the problem is, of course, that it's also harder to do, and that's why very often from people especially mediocre writers don't do it because you know it's hard to bring off um but certainly yes i mean one good implication is worth you know 10 or 12 pages of of act of exposition yeah uh, and, and i think also something that has i think it's going it's gone out of fashion a bit um i think i think especially in because with the encroachment of ya fiction and plus the way that that um, genre movies tend to get made now. There's a bit of a horror of leaving any space for the reader to, you know, to, to make their own yeah. decisions about things. And I think, I personally think that's a mistake. I think if you can leave a little bit of mystery in there, I think that, that mostly your work will be better for it. Uh, so if you can imply that something happened between two characters, but you never actually explain what that thing was, you can get away with that, mm-hmm. provided you well enough yeah you know because it'll be like oh my god wh- whatever was that and you maybe yeah. never knew. i mean well uh, casablanca is the case in point isn't it you know we'll always have paris mm-hmm. yeah so what exactly happened in paris well we, we 
don't know. We, we've got a, a, a pretty clear sense of, of what the gist was. Yeah. You know, they got together. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, as to what that actually was, you don't know. And you, you, you never need to know, really. It, it, it carries its own way as is. Yeah. And, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, you know, case in point of the sort of the, 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 the antithesis of this is Prometheus, where they took this brilliant, yeah. rather sort of haunting idea of this derelict spaceship that could be, you know, we don't know. It could be thousands of years. It could be a million years mm. old for all. No, yeah. we don't. We just don't know. Uh, this alien who was piloting it and these eggs, and you don't know in 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 the movie Alien, and in fact in in the you know two or three sequels to it as well. You you don't know what who that guy was, where he was yeah. from, how long he'd been there. Yeah. You don't know whether the eggs were maybe something to do with his species and life cycle, and that they just got out of hand somehow. Uh, or were, was this a cargo he was taking somewhere? Or were they bioweapons? You know, they, none of that is known. And not knowing it, I think, may cast a very deep shadow. And I, I, it, there's there's something very eerie. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you remember in the movie, but when they when they leave um, when they leave the pilot chamber, the last shot you get is of the the fossilized eye of the pilot of the pilot. Um, so the, the sort of skull like thing with the with the yeah. like elephantine um, yeah. proboscis, and as as they leave, I can't remember if Kane has already been got by then or not. But as they leave, the camera d- hangs about and it stays on on this eye, this empty eye socket, and and that's truly powerful because it's like you know you're never going to know, yeah. you know. And then of course, and then Prometheus comes along and goes, yeah, we'll tell you all about it, and. <laughs> And and a it turns out to be really facile and dull, uh, and and b it, it just we don't care. It, it, yeah. it shatters the the, yeah. the the sense of mystery, the sense of, of 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 the depth of time. I mean, in a way, I think the whole you know that 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 spaceship and that derelict spaceship was 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 more scary really than any of the monster antics that that go on later in the movie. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I love all that as well. But the point is, there's something very visceral and hardcore about the monster. Yes. It's a monster. We have to find a way to stop it, and it becomes a fight basically. But the stuff, the stuff before that, that's haunted house stuff. And you know, they're not, they're never really under any kind of threat in that no. space. And it's like, like most of horror films, not seeing the the monster is is the best part. And when the monster's shown, often it falls flat at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I say, I think that is one of the things where, again, when you're, when you're, you know, you're info dumping or however it is you're getting this data across, it, it, you know, Hemingway is right, I think, to some extent. If you can, you should try and get away with just, just leaving it very vague mm-hmm. or not specifying. It, it, it's also like, I suppose, the train for, you know, trying to tell origin stories yes. of all these characters or whatever. That are completely yeah. unnecessary. Don't need, I don't need to know what, how he got his powers. He's got his powers yeah, yeah. now. That's what yeah, I care about. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, and also, the thing that drives me crazy is that, that, by definition, you know, the whole concept of taking an interesting middle-aged character and saying, "Wow, wouldn't it be fascinating to see what this guy like was like at eighteen years old?" Well, well no, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. it wouldn't, because the reason he's interesting is because of what has happened to him in the last twenty years yeah. of his life. Um, and I say, when they, you know, I haven't seen Solo, but I, I, as soon as I heard it, we were making it, it's like, that's a dreadful idea. Yeah, that, the the um, biggest problems I had with Solo was they the explain why he's called Solo and how, he got, his how he got his gun and, and, and why he says certain lines because someone said it to him this way and this. And you think, not everything has to have a reason behind it. You know, you can things can just be, and I can make up my own kind of. Yeah, idea and, uh, in my head of why he does it, or it's just a cool thing. I don't need to explain. It kind of takes the coolness away from it. I think if you explain it, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And and um, well, I mean the same thing with the Star Trek reboot. I mean, going back a bit now, I'm talking about when you know you're introduced to the entire crew when they were 18 years old, mm-hmm. and and again, it's like I'm not interested in those people. They, that's the point. They were your standard issue teenagers, yeah. and quite far from the fact that the idea of a teenager piloting a starship was a bit, you know silly anyway but but also the whole idea is is that by definition we we, you know we are made up of our past and and the more past got the more interesting it's likely to be um and yeah i i struggle with this i really do because it's i mean obviously from the franchise point of view it's great because you you've got all this ready-made 
material that you can just go to work on. But I say, I think it feels to me like like sort of hollowing out the foundations. Yeah. And I eventually these things collapse, you know, from lack of their own weight. I mean, I think you saw that with the Terminator thing. Yeah. Fact, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know. And 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 looking at the the Netflix version of of your work. You know, that there's quite a lot of changes that, that were made in that from the original source material and from what I imagine the original script was that was in the offing with Joe Silver and stuff. Um, you know, people, have, he's more of a hero in, in the Netflix show perhaps than he is in the books, more of a not yeah. quite as grey a character. Um, and I know the next season's not even going to be a straight-up adaption of, of the sequel, Broken Angels. And is that is is a plan to expand the story or is, it, is a TV show going to chart a whole new course that the books don't go? Well, I think the, I mean, the idea was to try and, I mean, I was out with the writer's room uh, a year and a half ago, uh, thrashing stuff out for season two. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, they did, he wanted to use Broken Angels, but the problem is you just, there's no way you don't have the budget. I mean, that was, that's, that's widescreen space opera. Yeah, yeah. Starships, 18 miles long, um, you know, planetary wars. Uh, They're literally, they're just, they just, you know, even with Netflix's, um, you know, budget, mm-hmm. there's just no way for them to do justice to that. So what they tried to do was to take the basic characters and interactions and um, and, and extract the, 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 the essence of what the book's about. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- that it certainly seemed to be going that way last time I, you know, I was in touch with them. Um, and then, then obviously, yes, there is the problem that the, the book, the, 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 the show has already diverged somewhat from the book. Mm-hmm. So by the end of Altered Carbon season one, we're already in somewhat different territory than we were at the end of the book. So they have to somehow link it to that as well. Um, so that, it, it's a tough gig. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, in a way it's great for me because it means that when I do get around to watching season two, it's going to be a big, big surprise to me. Because, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, I think um, most of the changes in the first season, I there's very clear reasons why they did it, you yeah. know, as, yeah. as often as not structural reasons rather yeah. than cultural reasons and i think we've Um, all seen shows that or films that have been slavish adaptions of books and you think you know the it's not you're not i think you you need to play to the medium strength and i think you can you need to say not everything on the page will work on film and no no and it really was i mean one of the things i say you 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 don't necessarily i mean i've obviously i've spent a lot of time looking at those episodes and i looked at the scripts when they came in i looked at the episode the raw cuts when they were you know the rough cuts and um, and one of the things you realise is that there's almost nothing in the book that hasn't been ported into the show in some shape or form, mm-hmm. and that includes thematic idea uh, yeah. echoes and yeah. theme ideas and, and so forth. And so very often you'll have something that it's in the book, but a different character says it in in the show, yeah. or it's deployed in a different way. And um, you know, they really, I mean, they really had a great sense of what the material was. And and I say, when there were changes, I mean, like a lot of people were annoyed about the fact that um, Kawahara turned out to be his sister. Yeah. But the thing is, you have to look at the logistics of that. You know, I, in the book, it was easy. I got away with just mentioning this woman's name in passing. Yeah. And then later on, I could, ha-ha, ta-ta, it's this woman. And it, it's fine because you you can do that in a novel. Mm-hmm. The problem is in a, in a TV show, no one is going to remember no. what, some offhand comment from eight hours before uh so you couldn't possibly do it that way but at the same time if you introduce a flashback of a character you know that kovacs remembers Mm -hmm. railing kawahara by definition if you do that then people are going all right we'll be seeing her again yeah Uh, yeah. you know so and by by making her into the sister they solve that problem because it's like that flashback that he has with with her in the early you know in the in the first episode it feels p- perfectly natural because it's his sister and you don't necessarily think oh well we'll be seeing her again because you know she's his sister and he's and she's dead yeah and you're it's, it's part of his story rather than showing yeah, who she exactly is. And, and and you know the, the making making it his sister gave it a charge that allowed them to carry the same you know narrative trick in the show which i say they, i didn't have to do in the book i wasn't necessary i, yeah. I could get and and in a lot of cases when there were modifications when there were changes it, you can actually see you know that there was good structural reasons why they had to do that mm-hmm. um so yeah i mean it was it's like, i have to say I, I it was a really very pleasant experience for me oh, um working with with lita calagridis on this because i think she she really honored the book in adaptation uh and yeah there are differences and changes and, and there's some even some i mean i'm quite candidly you know there's some changes that i didn't like um but 
what I couldn't ever dispute was the fact that she absolutely honoured the source material yeah. um, you know, in, in every way possible. Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I loved the book yeah. uh, when I first discovered it um, and I thought the show was a great adaptation yeah, of, that, of that story. It really did take, as you say, it took the essence of yeah, what that Yeah, the idea book, of uh, yeah, the characters, the That the book themes, is yeah. and made a really good show out of it, I thought. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sorry. mean, I mean, how much of a of a input did you have in the in the writers' room and stuff? Was it? Did you have a contract at all? Did, you know, when that deal was made. Yeah, no, I mean the the deal, and I think to be honest, this is quite common these days with with TV adaptations because the the the, the money in play is not quite as sort of colossally um, impactful as as uh, major movies, um, and also the point with TV shows is that they're not needing to make their money back in the same way that a, a film studio yeah. has to. Mm -hmm. So the point being that with a, you know, if, if you're, if Autocarbon had been adapted by Silver Pictures into a, a blockbuster sci-fi movie, yeah. there's so much, there'll be so much money plowed into it and they would need to make such a big return on it that they would have to sort of insulate the, the film from, from any kind of potential damage. I don't know, did you ever see that movie um, Saving Mr. Banks? Uh, no, I didn't. The Tom Hanks the one about uh, is it Tom Hanks? yeah, it's about um, the Disney, Disney yes. adaptation yeah. of um, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, yes. yeah. And um, he's going on about how uh, Hanks plays Disney, and at the end, where she, the writer, is she's really angry and she's she's pissed off with the way that it's been that it's been you know mauled about, mm -hmm. and he sort of he says to her, "Look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're upset, but it's too late. I have to protect this movie." Um, mm -hmm. And th this is a very real thing, you know. If you've laid out a couple of hundred million dollars on a movie, you've got to make that money back. Yeah. Um, now, people like HBO, Netflix, um, AMC, whoever, whoever they might, or BBC for that matter, whoever they might be, they don't have that problem because what they're doing is presenting something as part of a slate. Yeah. And and they don't. It, it's not seen in terms of return on each given thing. It's like we need to provide, a, um, you know, a smorgasbord here. And we want to make sure that we are, you know, enough people are eating at the smorgasbord. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, in that sense, the constraints are a lot looser. And what that, one of the things that means is that that people like me get to stand a lot closer to the action, uh, because I say if silver pictures are made, there's no way. I mean, they wouldn't let me touch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Take your large check, cash it, go away. <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas I say with with Lita, she was she, she was really enthusiastic from the start. She was saying, "Look, when do you want to come? When are you going to come out and see us? And uh, yeah. let's sit down and talk about it. Um, I'll That's send fantastic. you the script." Yeah, and she sent me she sent me uh, casting reels of the various actors they were considering. Uh, we went back and forth on on you know potential casts for for characters and so forth. And uh, even I mean I remember one conversation. I was I was at a convention in Barcelona and I was actually on my way up a street trying to find a, a lecture that I was supposed to give. Um, I wasn't there'd been a bit of a mess up and I was so I was stalking through the streets of Barcelona trying to find this this library that I was supposed to go to to, to give a talk in. Um, and at the same time, on the phone to Lita Calagridis, arguing about what we were going to call um, the, um, you know, the sort of the the protectorate thug units, because uh -huh. obviously the envoys became something else yeah. in the show. So, and we're like, well, what are we going to call these people? And we were bashing acronyms back and forth, you know, across the ether while I was desperately walking up <laughs> up the night in Barcelona. So. That kind of thing was was really exhilarating, and um, and and yeah, really really nice. Uh, and yeah, they, they. I mean, I think you know, it was very clear that they were always whatever I contributed was always going to be theirs to take or leave as they saw fit. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, you couldn't really have it any other way because I mean, the, you know, these people have been making screen entertainment for many many years of their lives, and I I had never done that. So the likelihood is that if we disagreed, probably they would be right. And I would be wrong, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in fact, that case in point that actually happened with um, with the hotel, because yeah. we couldn't get the Hen hotel Hendrix because the Hendrix estate wouldn't wear it. Basically, oh, okay. not surprisingly, I mean, when you think about it, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, symbol of peace and hippie, hippie, uh, <laughs> uh, hippie, the hippie lifestyle. There's no way they were going to write, go agree to have him portrayed as <laughs> murderous, psychopathic um, AI hotel, and. Um, so we couldn't get that. So we went through a whole bunch of other things. We had some other ideas. We battered them back and forth. And eventually somebody, I don't know who it was, somebody in the writer's room came up with this idea of, ah, well, look, why don't we have a girl on Poe? Because 
mm-hmm. you know, he invented the detective story, and, and then we could call the hotel the Raven. And um, and when I, when this was presented to me, I'm like, yeah, don't mm, don't really like this. Um, and I, I and I didn't. I was polite about it, but I I, I really really didn't like it, mm-hmm. and uh, I kind of felt we were losing something. But then of course, when you saw what they did with it, you're like, oh my god, this is brilliant! Yeah. Yeah. You had the, the, all the the internal decoration in the in the lobby of all the the the, the sort of Escher print um, ravens fading out mm-hmm. into as they fly away into nothingness, uh, and. The fact that he's he's got a raven to wake him up in the morning. His alarm clock is a raven perched on a um, you know on a um, on a perch, and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And then to say the thing of 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 um, the fact that um, Poe want because he sees himself as a detective, he wants to be involved in it. In, yeah. In yeah. yeah, And it was just the it gift worked that really really well. I thought. Yeah, and, and the, the other thing about it was that I mean, so my my first you know as I sort of saw what they were doing with it, I started to think. You know what you call this one wrong. I, this actually is pretty damn good. Good stuff. It's a good idea. Mm. And then, when the show came out, of course, everyone fell in love with Poe, and they thought he was brilliant. And it was like, oh my god, he's the best thing in the show. I love, love the, you know, the 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 Raven Hotel, and yeah. So you know, Caligridis and her crew. You know, hats off to them because they 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 came up with that and they went, yes, this 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 is what will work. Mm-hmm. And I would never have seen that. I couldn't have seen that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have the the industry skill. I didn't have the experience. I'd, um, and so I say, for me, that um, it wasn't the only time this happened, but that was a very humbling experience for me because it was a case of, yeah, if we, if everyone had listened to you, then we wouldn't have done this, and yeah. we would have missed this golden opportunity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you 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 have to bring a bunch of humility to it to the the adaptation and accept that. You know, you created a piece of art in one medium. These people are experts in another medium, and they know what will and won't work. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you really have to go with that. Um, and and speaking of other mediums, you have written in other other uh, forms as well. You you've uh, obviously screenplay, but you've written some comics, and also you've worked on video games as well. And how how do you, how have you found those different, especially the video game? writing what how, how have you found that sort of experience oh that was brilliant i mean I, I you know i have to the caveat is that with all these things with the with the comic books and with the um video games i was an honored guest i mean i was invited in mm-hmm. uh, so electronic arts came looking for me specifically and asked if i wanted to come on board and do some work for them and similarly i got a marvel comics editor ring me up and ask me if i would like to write some right. black so that's obviously a lovely experience from from you know from the word go uh but it um yeah i mean each each thing brings its own its own um learning curve because yeah. you you you've got to you've got to change that you've got to shift it i had no idea how to write comics at all and basically the, my editor at the time jenny lee had to sort of hold my hand and lead me through the basics of it and so look you know it's this is how many panels you're going to have a page roughly and you, you need to describe each panel and it's got to be like this got i had i was trying i tried to try to palm her off with something that looked roughly like a screenplay mm-hmm. script um you know and she's going no 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 it's got to be panel by panel yeah. you know um so there was a learning curve there uh, and that was a lot of fun and and, and uh, but again it was a lot of fun because i you know, I, I was invited in, and then I was given this amazing crew of people to work with. And I still remember, you know, Jenny Lee saying to me, "Oh yeah, well, we've got this guy Goran Parlov. He's gonna he's gonna do the, um, you know, the the uh, the pencils and uh, and uh, and then I've managed to get Bill Sinkovich for finishes." And I'm like, "Oh right, um, so is he is is he good then?" Because <laughs> I'd never, I mean, I say I wasn't I wasn't a big comics reader. Yeah. I had no clue of what she'd managed to, to you know, to, to swing for me. And, um, yeah, and of course, Bill knocked it out of the park. It was brilliant, brilliant work you did on, on that first arc. And, um, you know, so so those experiences were coloured very much by the fact that I came in at this very rarefied level. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, again, both times, you know, the same with the games, huge learning experience, you, you, a learning curve. You're, you're, you're constantly having to skill up to, uh, to do the work. Right, um, right. In a game, are you, I mean, I suppose both of the, or, so it was Crisis 2 and Syndicate uh, that yeah. you've written. Uh, those were more linear, you know, because some games obviously can change the, depending on what happens and all that sort of things. But were they more linear stories? 
was it a more conventional writing process or did you have to oh, say yeah, if this happens were, then that kind of a thing yeah no i mean those were both fairly straightforward um you know fps games yeah. um and there weren't really you know we weren't dealing with i mean i i'd, I'd had quite a lot of sort of experience from the consumer end i was i was a, an avid gamer mm-hmm. by started playing when I got published, basically, because I suddenly had time and disposable income, and uh, which is something teachers don't usually have much of either of. And um, so, yeah, I played a few games, and I was very, I had some very clear ideas of what I liked and didn't like in games. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, they were pretty straightforward in terms of scripting. It was like, yeah, well, you know, here, this is the, there's a narrative thread, and we have to get through these these various levels. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, so that wasn't difficult. But what was what was instruct you know for me what the learning curve for me was the the fact that what you're writing is not really that important in the sense that the game is based you know what will make or break the game is the gameplay. Gameplay, yeah, yeah. And and what you're writing is is a kind of cantilevering s- structure to hold the gameplay up, mm-hmm. and um and and therefore you know it doesn't matter how well you've written a scene if if it doesn't support the gameplay then it's no bloody use yeah yeah and, and that was that was again a quite a humbling experience because you realize that yeah you are you're not the you're not the first fiddle here you you yeah. are actually quite a long way down the list of people who need to be listened to um and uh, yeah i mean there were times when i was i had to have meetings and literally say look guys i'm sorry but if you do this you will break the story uh, you know won't make any sense but but there were only like a couple of occasions where that was the case most of the time it was people saying to me yeah look this is this is lovely and all but we that is not going to get us to the next action bubble um we need we need something that will get us into the into this action bubble and so it was a much more of a piecemeal process yeah. you know, you're, you're writing bits and pieces. You're writing a cutscene here. You're writing some lines of dialogue here. You're you're creating in-game content that can be picked up by the player and so forth. Um, and that was yeah, that was kind of fun because there's a sort of there's a sort of uh, it's like wiping down a table. You know, mm-hmm. you get your you get your um, you, you know you get your flash spritzer and your cloth and <laughs> wipe down the table. That's it. That table is now clean. I'm done. And on to the next thing. And similarly, it was uh, okay. I need five lines of dialogue here that explain why the hell we're standing on top of this building. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. There's your lines of dialogue. Bang, we're done. Um, and that that kind of piecework can be quite satisfying, I think, especially when if you're like me, if you if if your main gig is novel writing, where you're going to spend a year or more before you see anything that could be called complete. Um, so having something that you can write in about an hour and a half and, and, and yeah, then say, yeah, the stop. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah you, you send it away, you get it signed off. Did they sign off on that? Yeah, they did. Oh, awesome. Right. Scratch that from the, to yeah, Google. Yeah. Um, so, so that was nice. And, and also there was a, yeah, there was a kind of, there was a, there was a, a real sort of rush to it as well, because, because it, you know, you the game build is iterated so rapidly, so, so regularly everything can change really fast, which means that you, you, you're constantly thinking on your feet. You're constantly having to play catch up. You know, someone shows up at the meeting and goes, yeah, we're, you remember that stuff that you were writing last week about when the Marines go into that building and this, yeah, we're not having that. Um, <laughs> and you're like, oh, good, right. What are we having instead? Well, we were thinking about underwater. And yeah. <laughs> um, so you, 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 you're immediately, you know, you're, you're always on your toes. On oh, your toes, yeah, yeah. I, and it's quite. I say, and I can I can remember at one point when we were doing audio in London, and I was in the in the recording studio with with the actor that we'd got to do these these lines, and I was literally rewriting the rewriting the lines there in the studio on my laptop, firing them across to the to the the studio studio printer in the corner of the room, grabbing them off and going, here, look, take give, take ten minutes, look at that, then 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 we'll read that into the mic and see how it sounds. Um, and that very was stressful. A, well, it was stressful, but it was also there was a real buzz to it. I mean, it was mm. it was you know because when it was working, I mean, they, I don't know. Did you either of you guys play Crisis? Yeah, yeah, played yeah, Crisis, yeah. Played it through, yeah. Right. Well, do you remember the the, the sort of semi sane um, radio DJ who yes. thinks an ex marine? Yes. I right. well, we had to come up with you know I had to come up with something that would would enable the player to keep up on events outside the, the main narrative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, and I say I'd always been a fan of um, Hardware the movie, and of course you've got Angry Bob in Hardware the um, <laughs> Iggy, Iggy Pop um, DJ. So I thought, well, we, we, we'll get some, we'll have someone like that, and we can actually you know use him to drip feed bits in. 
So we got we got this American actor who was a jobbing actor in London, brought him in, and he was really game. He was really up for it. And uh, yeah, and to say so, the two of us really struck sparks off each other because I was like hammering out this the, the these these monologues. And sort of really, really ramping it up, and uh, you know, throwing some more obscenities here and all the rest of it, and, <laughs> and then giving it to him, and he's like reading it, and he was kind of cackling over some of the lines. He said, "Oh, sorry, sorry, back up, let's do that again." Sorry, I <laughs> didn't see that one coming. Um, and it was, there was, you know, it was fun. It was. There's no way, no getting away from it. It yeah. was, yeah, it was a bit stressful, but it was. There was a real, a real. Uh, crack to the to the, you know to, and, uh, to it, working. It must make a big difference in terms of being someone that writes novels all the time to where you're on your own a lot of the time, creating that story in your head. To suddenly being able, to, it's you know a much more interactive uh, process. That oh yeah, well that's the other thing is that yeah, by definition, novel writing is a pretty lonely business. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas game writing, but is is infinitely collaborative. I mean, you spend so much time in meetings. Um, and yeah, it, in that sense, it was great. It was very refreshing, um, and to be to have instant critique. So literally, write three lines of dialogue. A room full of people will then talk to you about it. Um, so that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all you know, you know. Change is as good as a rest, and that I found that very invigorating. Nice. Um, so, and I, I say for anyone who's a, who's aspiring, you know, to write in general terms, game writing is is a really interesting place to be, mm -hmm. and still continues to be because. You know the, the the shape of games is changing all the time, yeah, definitely. and in fact, now those games, Crisis Two, Syndicate, looking back on them now, they feel slightly antiquated um, mm -hmm. because the, the because the you know the way that games have moved on. I mean, you know, open world gaming has has changed so much since since Crisis. Mm -hmm. um, Crisis was formative; it had you know it had a, quite a hand in shaping open world gaming, especially the first game. Yeah, absolutely. Which I, which I wasn't on, but. Um, you know, but now if you compare that to something like you know Shadow of Mordor, um, yeah, yeah, uh, the 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 way in which it's changed, the 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 way in which story now gets deployed across a game space rather than in a narrative of any sort, yeah. um, is is just astonishing. And so, yeah, if you if you go into if you know if you get a gig as a game writer, I think it's it's a really fascinating place to be applying your 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 craft um because every day brings something new and that you know you know that things are going to change and that even you know so if you work on a really great game and, and it comes out and it does really well it's there's still a good chance that in two years time you're going to be doing something that is utterly utterly different to, well, to that, that game that, that's right i mean there are the games you're talking about but we actually we spoke uh, recently to um Ian Dallas, who's who's one of the creators of, uh, have you heard of What Remains of Edith Finch, uh, the game? It, it's what they term. I've heard of it. I haven't. Uh, yeah, it's one of these. I suppose the the unfair term is a walking simulator yeah. type game, but it, you know it was a really powerful story that they've crafted there mm -hmm. with good gameplay that um, is completely. It's a million miles away from something like Grand Theft Auto or something yeah. like that, but. That shows the sort of spectrum, and it tells a story that could only really be told yeah. in a game mode. I think. Yeah, as well. I think yeah. that's right. It, the, so, yeah, I think games writing is a is a fascinating field too. Yeah, and too. it's 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 one that a lot of writers don't think about. I think as a as an no, and I, and I'd say I wish I, I wish that I had. You know, I mean, I think I mean back when I was getting my start back in the nineties, game writing was very very restrictive. Then I mean, there was a limit to what they could do mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, absolutely. But, Again, I mean, I, I, it's a shame because had I had I, I had an inkling, I, I probably could have gone and made a halfway decent living, you know, as a jobbing game writer mm -hmm. yeah. during that period as well. And then, you know, still got on with the novel in the evenings. But the difference is I would have been doing something I love during the day as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would say general advice for writers is always, for Christ's sake, don't limit yourselves. You know, you, you look at look at screenwriting, look at TV writing, look at comic books, look at games, you know, Anything that you think you might be able to, um, you know, earn a buck at, it's worth a look. Uh, you know, and who knows how that will affect your your style later on. Yeah, you know? absolutely. yeah absolutely. So, so what's next then, Richard? Well, I'm at the moment. I'm working on a sequel to Thin Air. Uh, right. That's I've, I'm, I guess I've got what have I got? I've got about a dozen chapters of that down, and uh, I'm sort of regrouping at the moment. I've mm. been sat down with my editors and, and looked at it and we've talked a bit about um, shape, you know, where it's going and, um, and uh, there are things I need to go back and tidy up and so forth. So that's, that's on, on up on blocks in the garage and, um, and we're working on that. 
Um, there's the Kovach, the Kovach spin-off comic book from Dynamite Comics, yeah. and that's ongoing. We, there's a second a second uh, graphic okay. novel coming from there. So I'm again advisory on that. So I'm going over over the comic book script and sort of discussing it. It's I'm taking more of a back seat this time. And last time it was very much a collaborative effort, and I I did quite a lot of the writing myself, and we the other writer and I sort of traded stuff backwards and forwards. This time around, it's different writer, and I'm necessarily having to to take more of a back seat, and so I'm really just sort of overseeing and. Mm-hmm making sure that the continuity works and things like that. Yeah. Um, so there's that as well. Um, I'm still waiting on, and we'll see what happens. You know, season two of the show is due to drop, I think, in the spring next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm waiting on what, you know, whether they want me to be involved in the in the run-up to that at all, the publicity of it, and, and even, you know, whether they're lo- looking at a, season, a third season and if that is mm-hmm. something that needs to be, um, you know, sort of uh, break, have, have break ground mm-hmm. on and, and, and look at as well so I'm, I'm leaving space clear for that um and yeah i that's that's you know it's a full slate that's quite a lot yeah to be fair <laughs> <laughs> blade runner or blade runner 2049 oh 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 that's difficult ah <laughs> uh, I got to opt for the original, um, just because you know twenty forty nine is built upon the original, and yeah. whereas the first one wasn't built on anything, they they just yeah. they just that. Yeah, yeah. that's um, fair, fair answer. I love them both. They are they're both excellent. Yeah, they're, both, yeah. they're both very very compelling. Although interestingly enough, I think you know I I I have watched the first one obsessively. I mean, I'm, I've got most of the dialogue by heart. Um, I must have watched that film at least twenty times. Uh, whereas I've seen Blade Runner 2049 twice, maybe th- mm-hmm. uh, twice. I watched it at the cinema and I bought the DVD when it came out. Uh-huh. Um, and I will watch it again, but I'm not in any particular hurry. Uh, you know, whereas I can remember when we, I had I had this old VHS copy of Blade Runner, and it's like whenever you come back from the pub, we all sit down. Yeah. Like, what- watch what do you want yeah blade runner blade runner put blade runner on you know despite the fact i've probably watched it two weeks before you know um and i think blade runner is one of those movies it's like the good the bad and the ugly it's like heat it's like it's one of those movies where if you turn on the tv and it's on and it's yeah, half you have free, to watch the end of it it doesn't matter what time of night it is you're going no i gotta watch this to yeah, the end. yeah definitely. absolutely um and i don't think 2049 managed to 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 get to that you know it um you know, it was. I think I say I think that what's his name, Villeneuve. Mm-hmm. I think he was given an almost impossible task. Yeah. Um, yeah sure. And he he almost brilliantly succeeded. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. He's brought. I mean, his a previous film, Arrival. Well, Arrival was also fantastic. Arrival, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, he's. There's no question. He, he that was such such an incredibly difficult um, task to be given. To you know, here's this iconic movie that will actually be out of date in two years time um, <laughs> and uh, and and has been you know has been proven wrong on numerous levels uh you know uh but at the same time remains colossally iconic for, for our entire culture um how about you just make a sequel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh sure yeah uh, no problem uh, no pressure um and i think he succeeds i mean it's it, it's very much its own movie but yeah. it is very much recognizably you know builds on the first um it has some flaws um yeah. I think the Jared Leto character was a. He, just he's, a, he's, a he's the weakest part of it, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's such a shame because I think Leto is an amazing actor, and and he turned in a brilliant performance. But it's like, what is this guy doing here? He belongs to a Marvel movie, you know. Yes. Uh, yes. We don't need a bad guy, you know. The first film didn't have a bad guy. This guy, this film movie doesn't need a bad guy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and there were a couple of things. You know the, the 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 replicant resistance. I was a bit. I was like, nah, I don't know about that. It feels a bit plastic. Um, so there were there were there were things with it. It felt to me like I think it it felt to me like a movie that had been made by committee and they hadn't been ruthless enough when it came to to actually cutting down to the shooting script because I think they could have lost a number of elements of that. Yeah, without, yeah. I would probably without, I probably agree with that. I think without it suffering, I think. Um, yeah, there were things that could have been comfortably taken out and, and really wouldn't have hurt um, the the overall narrative. Um, so, yeah, uh, but but that said, it was a 
brilliant piece of art and to say I, I say I'm glad I own it. I've got it on Blu-ray and I will watch it again, no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> but no, sorry, short answer. Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just cut to that. <laughs> uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh Christ! Um, uh, can I, uh, neither. Um, <laughs> I. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I loved Star Wars because I was like eleven when I saw it, yeah. and um, and then I loved The Empire Strikes Back because again I wasn't that much older when I saw that either. Um, and between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, I went to see Mad Max. Um, the Alien and Escape from New York, mm-hmm. I think. And it's like, game over, guys. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, that changed my, my yeah. parameters yeah. so radically um, as to what I thought of as, as science fiction. that I, went, I mean, okay, and Jedi was shite anyway. Um, but when I went to see Return of the Jedi, I'm like, you know, even with the early stages, I'm like, yeah, this is all right, I guess, but it's all a bit bright and shiny, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the weakest of the three for sure. Yeah, and then and then of course you have fucking Ewoks show up, and you're like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, so I and I bailed out at that point. I mean, I bailed out mentally halfway through Return, and I've never really gone back. Fair um, enough. And I so it's it's got no. I mean, I went to see um, uh, which one? Uh, the, the, not, not the new one, but the. Um, uh, what was it? Christ, what was it called? The last one, not the one that's oh, just coming. The Rogue Last one. Jedi. The Last Jedi, yeah. Oh, Last oh, Jedi, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rogue yeah. One was good, I thought, because it felt different than the rest. Oh, I've not seen that. Oh, I, 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 it's my favourite of the of, of the newer ones, for sure. Right. It feels more well, like no, a kind of war movie, almost, than a, than a Star Wars film. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard good things about it. But I just, I say, I never I, I never really got back into it. And I went to see The Last Jedi, Jedi, and I was watching it. I was watching the bit with the, you know, with the bomb racks. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. And I'm like, Oh come on, fucking <laughs> bomb rack! And then, and then I grabbed hold. I sort of, you know, mentally grabbed myself by the lapels and went, "Oh yeah, yeah." But what about shooting down Tie Fighters from a fucking gun turret? You know, <laughs> uh, you know by hand. Uh, and it's like Maybe you go, the swords yeah. that, that that just stop after a certain point. Yeah, it's just you. Know, you, you, have to, you have to just, you know, you've got to go with it. Exactly. You, you have exactly. To, you have to. Yeah, and and I say, unfortunately for me, I never went back. So that that sort of cut Star Wars out of the equation. But uh, similarly with Star Trek, um, you know, I kind of feel that it's it's a corpse walking because in its time, I mean, go back to the original Roddenberry um, show, you know, that was, what was that, 1962, 63? Yeah, something like, something that. like yeah, that. I mean, that was such an incredible show for its time, mm-hmm. you know. The, the, you know, the enormous things. It's, it, uh, it's funny, I've been playing a game called um, Mafia 3. I don't know if any... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. I, well, and you know how the, the the NPCs are sort of gibbering as you walk past mm-hmm. them. Uh-huh. And and Star Trek comes up because it's the episode where Kirk kisses Uhura. Uh, yes, um, that's right, yeah. And yeah. they're all, you know, the all the inhabitants of New Bordeaux, they're all scandalised by this yeah. because yeah. This, here's this white man kissing this black woman. And... You know that is just. I think that's just one example of of how you know how forward thinking it was. What a, you know how powerful it was yeah. for the times. Um, but I kind of feel that again, we we've just left. We, we're in a place yeah. now where it doesn't make any kind of sense, and that paradigm, you know, has been shattered so many times over the last you know forty fifty years that. You know, it doesn't. There's no way for to make it fly anymore because you like you go well. You can't have the federation that as envisaged in the original show because that's just ludicrous. Mm-hmm. You know, we all know that that's not how power yeah, yeah. works. And um, um, but at the same time, if you try and then retrofit it, which obviously they've done a couple of times, that doesn't work either because it's it's like because you're you're you're, you're terrified of throwing out too much bathwater. So. You you sort of keep in the the, the you know the, the the fan service as it were, yeah. and at the time you're then you're trying to sort of layer on this this patina of of, of sort of grim dark or whatever on top of it, yeah. and it, it just doesn't work. I'm um, looking forward again, to I, the to the well the newer stuff. I'm looking forward to because it, it does seem to be finally shifting into, into the future. And Trek's been quite obsessed with its past as of late, and I always find that quite dull. So I'm I am looking forward to not dull, but just a bit you know we've seen that already. So I am looking forward to seeing what. Season three of Discovery and the Picard show do moving the timeline right. forward. 
Because I think yeah. that is, that's the, the, the unknown's always the more interesting, I think. Well, yeah, but I say I also, I just think that I say that so much of what it, the show was based upon, we've, we've kind of transcended isn't really the word but yeah we've we've transcended it we've gone no you're so, right it's true there's, there's less it's it, it, i think i think i think the, the for me the pinnacle of it was um uh was um the movie star trek for the, the journey yeah, home yeah yeah, yeah. So, because that managed to sort of take the piss out of out of the out of the uh franchise you know it would it had this very knowing sort of humor to it mm-hmm. um and at the same time it managed to you know, make some very interesting points um, about you know the environment and yeah, yeah. you know it was prescient in that sense. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it was if you look at the concerns of that film, it, it's like oh my god, they they saw this one coming a mile off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and that's what I liked about it. But I kind of you know for me it was a swan song. It was yeah. a, a it sort of felt like it's like okay, we should everybody get off now. We, we were you know we've, we've reached the terminus. Yeah. Um, and I. I cannot generate interest in it. Um, you know, I'm much more. I'm, I'm not a franchise guy, to be honest. I, I so I'm much more interested in. Okay, what's um, Duncan Jones going to do next? You yeah, know, let's yeah. mm-hmm. see what he's going to bring out. Let's see what new realities we can we can come up with. Because each each in each in you know each each franchise, each show, each each movie. It is obviously born of its time, and the problem yeah. is that Star Trek was born of a certain time, and it still bears the the hallmarks of that, and it can't, you know, it can't really get rid of them without stopping being Star, Star Trek. Trek. It wouldn't yeah, be yeah. Star absolutely, Trek. yeah. Um, um, so I think neither. So I think the answer is neither. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair if, enough. I really, if I really, 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 really had to choose, I, I guess I would go with Star Trek because I say I, I I've got an enormous amount of respect for the original series. And I did love the return. I mean, I, I, I like so. I mean, I like the Wrath of Khan was pretty cool as well. So I sort of, yeah, of the two, if if I had to watch a movie, you know, of one or the other, I, I would opt for. I think I'd opt for anything Star Trek, um, you know, that that still had the original uh, actors in it. Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, last one, um, a real book or an e-book. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, real book nine times out of ten because. Um, I I can. Mm-hmm. I mean, ebooks are great. They're you know, I, I'm I'm the guy who always ends up used to end up taking an entire extra suitcase on holiday. With yeah. the book. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the, the Kindle has just you know shattered that because it's like okay, ten thousand books, and and also more to the point that you can be sitting on a beach somewhere, and someone says, oh wow, um, you know, so and so has just brought out a new novel. Apparently, it's really good, and you can go, oh good, well I think yeah. I'll read. Yeah, 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 yeah it, it is. And, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that for sure. And you've got it, you know, right yeah. there within. You know, you can be reading it within two minutes. So there's no getting away from how very powerful that is. But that said, I've still not really got used to reading on a screen, and um, and from preference, I never do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I kind of wish that we'd we'd reached a point where. You know, the publishing industry had sort of shouldered Amazon out of the way and said, "All right, look, we'll take it from here." Um, and we're doing a thing whereby, you know, if you buy the hardback, you get the e-download free. Yeah. Um, and and so you, you, whereas if you buy paperback, you would have to buy the the ebook separate uh, as a separate thing. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I, that would be great because I would basically buy hardbacks to keep at home and yeah, to yeah. read, you know, in, in at my convenience, and um, and have the Kindle around for when I have to travel. Mm-hmm. So I'm, 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 yeah. That's another long, lengthy. <laughs> long <debate. laughs> that's absolutely fine. Uh, I guess, yeah. I guess real book real is where book. I'm. Real book. Oh, yeah. But with a prefer- with with a space yeah. for ebooks. Yeah. <laughs> with, 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 with the proviso that I understand the the, the the beauty and sheer power of of the technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, but still, I, I you know I still have a preference for for, for real books if I can get them. Oh, Great, nice one. Certainly had some strong views on uh, Star Trek, Star Wars. I yeah, think. not not a massive fan as it turns <laughs> out. I mean, he, he obviously loves. Uh, he obviously loves sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, and and the Blade Runner films, you know. But yeah, I think you know, I to- I totally get it. Rather than franchise, he's following. He prefers to look at what his favorite filmmakers are making. Yeah, which is, I suppose that's yeah. right. Uh-huh. I mean, I suppose the only thing to say about it is that you know, without Star Wars and Star Trek, you wonder. If sci-fi would have reached that mainstream yes, that it has reached, right. it, you yeah. know, I, I totally get what you're saying that you get these more serious, harder 
sci-fi stories, but would they be made if you didn't yes, have... Yes, I think for every, every you know, Battlestar, the Galactica, or the Expanse, mm -hmm. you, you, they probably are on the shoulders of things like Star Trek, Star yeah, Wars. Yeah. And he definitely said the older shows, the original series was... Yeah, they were favorite. groundbreaking. And that was, yeah. it was groundbreaking. And I suppose as time goes on, it's maybe harder to do shows which have quite as much impact as, as it did back back in the day because of the audience that you're what you're playing it for and the, mm -hmm. and the environment that it's in. But thanks again to Richard for uh, chatting to us. Yeah. Uh, I hope you, as we have, enjoyed those two episodes where yeah. I think we got so much information, yeah. so, so many tips about how to write these types of novels. Yeah, how to build that world. Yeah, but also how to get published. Yeah. How, how to... Yeah realize when to stick when to twist if you like on your story and everything like that so really appreciate richard taking all that time to speak to us he did mention bill sinkovich there in relation to the comic work and um, if you don't know who bill sinkovich is he was a or is a legendary comics artist he, in the 80s he was kind of viewed as a revolutionary yeah. artist for for marvel and things so um yeah you can see why richard once he found out who he was, <laughs> uh, realised it was it was quite a big deal. But Marco, it's Christmas time. Let's give out some presents. Yes, indeed. We have one more present one to more give out. One more present to give out. The, the bottom right of the gear sack. Santa sack. <laughs> and that is uh, Claire Askew's What You Pay For, which is the latest book in the D.I. Birch series. Uh, we spoke to Claire last week. If you've not listened to that episode, highly recommend it. Yep. Uh, Claire, again, had lots of tips. Now, it was a very short run competition, but uh, if you want to draw the winner, who will get what you pay for and also their own page one notebook. Unsigned. <laughs> we can sign the notebook if like. you want, <laughs> but I don't imagine could also sign what you pay for underneath <laughs> Claire's name. Let's see who we've got here. Okay, so the winner of this week's competition is Lindsay C. We don't know your surname, Lindsay, but that is your Twitter bio, so... Yeah, yeah, you entered on Twitter, so we'll get in touch with you. Thank you very much. We'll announce the winner on Twitter and we'll, uh, and our other social media, and we'll get in touch with you so uh, you, we can get that sent to you and your own page one notebook as well, and hopefully it'll arrive before Christmas. Yeah. But uh, speaking of Christmas, we will be taking a short break over the Christmas and New Year period yep. uh, to recuperate <laughs> from all this effort in speaking to people. <laughs> Um, Finally a week without having to edit something. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I am looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, but we already have several uh, writers lined up yeah. for season three, which will be coming back at the end of January, all yes, things going so, well. Yeah, we should have an excellent season three. Yeah, so keep up. an eye on our social media. Make sure you've subscribed so that you get told when the new episodes come out. And don't forget, we've got a Christmas sale going on in the store. We do for our page one notebook, which is the writer's notebook. It's a structured notebook we've designed to help you plan your writing. Check it out on our website. The link is in the podcast description. And uh, yeah, grab one for Christmas. Yeah. You're happy very quick to make sure it re <laughs> arrives before Christmas. And so the, I think the only thing left to say is thanks to Simon Stokes for his assistance for this whole season, really, yeah. on the podcast. Couldn't help, do it without you. Help with the audio. Simon's a DJ and also teaches music at the Subsign Academy. We've put the link in the podcast description, so check that out if you're interested yep. in learning about that. And if anyone wants to get in touch, they can always send us a, an email to podcast at rightgear.co.uk or sling us a tweet to at right underscore gear. Yep. And otherwise, we hope you have a great Christmas and yeah. New Year. Thanks very much for tuning in every week. It's been that's the reason we do it. So yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, without without you guys, we would it would just be two of us speaking into the <laughs> void. Um, Which is pretty much what we were doing before we started recording. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So have a great time, and we'll be back at the end of January with lots of new writers, and hopefully their advice will help you become a successful writer yourself. It's a great uh, New Year's resolution. Exactly. Write that book next year. With a page one notebook, page one notebook. <laughs> which we'll leave you with now. Okay, have a great Christmas. See you later. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? 
And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Thank you.